Okay, so picking up from where Tom uh, introduced us and, and left us before the break, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do in terms of our actual data collection so you guys have an idea. Again, when we're there, we're going to go over all this, don't stress out, but, but it's important you guys at least have a flavor for what we're doing so it makes sense as we, as we continue to talk over the next couple weeks and as we're getting prepped and stuff. So this is a, a, a large effort. There's all kinds of folks that have been helping us, primarily uh, Tom and John and myself, but all kinds of guys, all, all types of students um, since forever. Um, uh, it's, it's awesome. So this year we have um, also folks from Tulane are going to be helping us this spring as well, so it's, it's great. The very first time, our very first trip, again, this class began and is still at fundamentally its core, this is a service learning exercise. This is about showing up and lending our backs and helping out, right? This was not designed as a research expedition. This was not designed as some high-minded intellectual class or something. It was rather let's show up and help. So we, very, we first showed up and Katie said, oh my God, I need some help. I need someone to, to count the trees for me. And then we said, uh, okay, we could probably do that. So uh, I didn't know any of the plants there, um, especially back then. And it was, what's going on? And so we started figuring out. Um, the problem was the um, community was tweaked by Hurricane Katrina. Radically changed the canopy, radically changed in effect, cut down a lot of the forest. These invasive species we talked about a few minutes ago blasted on in and started taking over. So the question was, hey, how many bad guys do we have in here? And where are they? And so our initial approach was to use banned transects. That's because where these critters were before the storm was primarily on the edges of the forest. They were in the trails. They were on the disturbed sections of the forest. And the intact forest with closed canopy, when it was, where it was dark or, or at least shady at midday, didn't have very many of them in there. And so that was the key observation. The observation was where we have messed up forest, where we have broken forest, we have more of the bad guys. So therefore, um, with that observation, we said, hey, let's start our surveys relative to the trails, which were the historic dis disturbance points in the forest, the historic places, even before Hurricane Katrina, where there, was, or there already were openings in the canopy, openings in the, the community. So we therefore did everything relative to those trail disturbances. So here we go, we have a trail, it's a little cartoon here to tell you the kind of things we're gonna document and measure and look at. So here we go, we have a cartoon trail and everything's gonna be relative to that trail. We have these trees, we're in a forest, right? So we have these trees. So when we encounter a tree that's in our survey zone, we'll talk about what the survey zone is in a second, but when we encounter a tree, how we articulate that there's a tree there is we write down what speed you guys will write down or record. We're working on seeing if we can get our first mobile app to work for to collect data, but but that may or may not happen. And even if it does, if it totally rains, we're always we always go back to paper and, and pencil. So so you'll, you'll probably be writing this down for at least some of our surveys, if not all the surveys. Um, but we're going to record the species. So what is it? Um, and then in your little survey area, we, we will document how many there are. Is there one individual? Is there a bunch? And what is the diameter at breast height? So again, that, that's how, how wide the tree is at, a, at your chest height. And then how tall is the tree itself? So these, these are, so the number is density. These other measures are a measure of demography, a measure of the the morphology of this. Is it a short guy? Is it a tall guy? Is it a young guy? Is it an old guy? And with trees, the younger the tree, the smaller they are. And the older the tree, the bigger they are. The wider they are, the taller they are. 
Ooh, excellent question. Estimate. So when we first start this, you, again, the first day or so, we're going to go slow like anything, and, and it's okay. Um, and then we need to start picking the pace up. And, and after you've done a few of these, trust me, it'll, it'll, it'll go much, much faster. So the first couple times, you're going to be measuring the tree, and you're going to be, oh, is that like 1.2 centimeters or something like that, right? Then pretty soon, once you get the hang of it, it's like, that's one, that's two, the right? So we're not going to be spending the time to precisely measure every single little teeny thing. Where that is most apparent is with the height of the tree. Now the DBH is easy because you guys have a ruler, have a ruler, we have the transect tape, you can just bang, put it up right there right in front of your face and it's 10 centimeters, right? The height is, is potentially really challenging depending on if there's a bunch of trees, if there's a bunch of stuff blocking our view or we can't, we can't look up and see what's up there, you're going to do your best. You're going to sort of eyeball, and again, the first couple times, you, everybody in your team will stand there. Well, it looks like about 10 meters. What do you think? No, it's like 15. Really? What do you think? I think it's about nine. Right? So you'll go back and forth, right? We have tools, clinometers and things you can actually use to, to do it accurately. We don't typically use those, though, because they take too long. We're going too fast. And more importantly, a lot of times you can't even properly see. There's so much stuff you can't. You can't really um, get a good handle. So we estimate. So we're going to say that's about 10 meters. It's about 5 meters. That's about 20 meters. And so there's error. That means there's error? Totally. We get that. That's understood. But you guys are going to essentially eyeball the height. And it'll make much more sense when we, when we, when we get there. So okay, so we're going to articulate the trees. That's a key metric for us. Why? The trees are the foundational species of this community. We want to see, uh, so these, these areas are typically called bottomland hardwood forest, cypress tupelo forest, meaning cypress trees and tupelo trees are, are the, the classic things we would see there. And so trees are really, really key. So we want to see both if there's bad trees there and if there's the trees that should be there, are they there, right? And because we've been doing this for so many years, we actually can look at how the forest has been recovering or not recovering. Are we seeing more and more of the bad guys? Are the bad guys dying off and the good guys getting, getting stronger and more, more robust and taller? We can, we can an answer those questions. So first we're gonna get, articulate that stuff. Then we're gonna articulate other things. Other things that we think tell us about the health and, and the other goings on in this forest. There's other stuff out there. And so um, the very first year we counted everything. We counted all the little teeny understory herbaceous plants and all this and that. And in fact, we did the second year too. And then I realized that, and John realized that this is, we don't care about that, right? So we, we focused on just a subset of the understory. And so the, those are two things that really seem to be important. Um, not every single plant. One is a blackberry. Hard to know what the exact species of blackberry. We think there might be up to three species of blackberry. We just call them blackberry. Is lump them all together. Rubus. Rubus, right. Blackberry is a disturbance loving thing, a disturbance filling thing. If we had a really healthy closed canopy, dark canopy, we'd see none or almost no blackberry. So blackberry is where we have a trail. Blackberry is where a tree fell down and created a tree gap in the, air, in the area. More about blackberry in a second. So blackberry is, is, at least in a general sense, some measure of disturbance. It doesn't mean bad, it doesn't necessarily mean it's evil, but it means disturbed. Ferns. Ferns are native. Ferns only grow where it's shady. If we have an open canopy that's crazy hot sun, baking hot sun, the, the ferns will die, or whatever ferns were there died. They just can't handle it, right? Just like, where do we see ferns? We see ferns in creeks, right? We see ferns in wetland, misty, cool areas. So ferns are an indicator that we have a pretty intact canopy, or at least, at least um, a modicum of, of closed canopy. So those two things are important. So we're going to say the, the, the percentage of blackberry cover, the percentage of fern cover. And then there's some other stuff, right? This is, this is a natural system. There's all kinds of other stuff going on. So other things we're going to denote are um, uh, fallen logs, fallen logs. So what is a log for our purposes? 
Our purposes are a log that is a wider diameter than my forearm, than your forearm, okay? If it's something the size of your thumb, if it's something the size of your two fingers, no. That's just a branch, we don't care about that. So we had to have some criteria, right? Would we have a, is a log bigger than a meter in diameter or what? And so we just, years ago, settled on bigger diam larger than the diameter of a forearm is a log. So we're going to articulate those guys. And then another thing, another thing that's not, and so obviously logs are not alive anymore, a key part of the ecosystem. They degrade, the fungus gets in there, beetles eat them, important part of the ecosystem, but not, not alive anymore. Another part of the ecosystem that's not alive are the leaves that have fallen off the tree, or, or duff, or, or parts bark maybe that has fallen off the tree. And we create this, this stuff that will eventually break down and become soil. So that's key. And again, just like the ferns are an indicator of a relatively healthy forest, so is, is relatively thick leaf litter. Why? Because we have all these leaves, and the leaves would be falling down and creating some layer of thickness. Where we've had the place nuked, and there are no trees or no living trees, it's going to be either, either um, no litter or at least much thinner litter. So we're just going to give it a rough estimate of depth. Boom. Is it a centimeter? Is it 10 centimeters? What? So those are the things you're going to articulate. Last couple things are canopy cover. We're, we'll have two gross measures of canopy cover. So you have to do a little bit of imagining here. The first is what we call overstory. So if you looked up in the air, that's over. So overstory meaning stuff above our head. In, in, the, in the context of this forest, means stuff above our head. And so uh, you're going to look up and see what proportion is native, what proportion is exotic. We don't worry about species. That's too hard. It takes too much time. Generally, for the stuff we're going on, there's going to be 100% native. Or, or, well, yeah, whatever. There's open sky as well, but if, but if there's stuff, it's either going to be 100% native or a very high proportion of exotic or maybe you know, a mix. But it's, it's, it, generally speaking, it's not going to be a really hard one for you guys to figure out. You'll, you'll be able to tell. It's either going to be tons of tallow around you or, or not a lot of tallow around you, for example. So what you're going to do is you're going to, we're, we're standing in the forest. I'm looking up. I'm looking up and I'm eyeballing it. I'm imagining I'm in a balloon, you know, 30 meters above my head looking down, right? So imagine we're flying over with a drone looking down and, and that's what we're going to get for the estimate of the cover. Then we're going to do, oh, uh, yeah, okay. So those other things I mentioned were the understory. The blackberry, the leaf litter, that, 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 that stuff is understory, but never mind. Okay, so how are we going to articulate this? We are going to go and we have spaced out, so Tom was referring earlier to plots. We're not talking about plots here. We're talking about surveys relative to the trail. We call these the band transects. That's what you guys are going to be doing, 99% of what you guys are going to be working on, the band transects. So here we go. We've had these areas spaced out, and they're, they're, they're flagged. The very first day, the very first day when Tom is teaching you guys the plants, I'm going to be driving around in a four-wheeler thing and stopping and re-flagging these things that we've flagged every year. So every 50 meters, we've marked these sites out. So we go back to the same spots in the trail. Maybe it's a meter or so this way or that way because some trees fell down, it's hard to see, but it's basically the same spot. We're gonna go off and everything is relative to how we're walking. So we do trail right. So we're gonna leave the parking lot and we're doing trail right. And so here we go, trail right, and it's boom. So we're going we're gonna to plant our transect tape. So there's going to be, a, pin, there's gonna be a, a, a marking up here that says whatever, 150 meters, let's say. So you walk up, and what we essentially do is we leapfrog. So we all start out, and, and I put team one on 50 meters, team two on 100 meters, team three on 150 meters, et cetera, right? And some sites, just because of the lay of the land or how the plants grew, are going to go super fast. Others that have a ton of blackberry will take you a lot longer. So, um, and, and as, as you guys are getting better and better as the week goes on, you'll be getting faster and faster. So the general approach, how it's going to work is there's going to be a team on this. As soon as you finish, you walk up and you're going to be 
walking past the groups, and then when you get to an undone one, you do that. So it's a, we're all well leapfrogging around each other, right? So we're all roughly in the same area when we start. Okay, now, um, I, we have transect tapes. We're gonna put the transect tape, start it in the middle of the trail. So in some cases, the trail's about a meter wide. In some cases, the trail's about three meters wide. Whatever it is, we're gonna pick the center of the trail. I'm gonna hold on to my tip of my transect tape, and it's gonna start. And I'm gonna take that transect tape and run straight off 90 degrees to the trail, off into the woods. Boom, straight on out, okay? And that's gonna define the, 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 where we're going, right? In a straight line. Now, again, this is one that you guys will figure out rapidly how to do this. It's however to do it as quickly as we can. There's not much blackberry, and, and it really depends on the year and how cold it's been and all these various factors. But basically, you could just go, whoosh, boom, walk straight on out, awesome, boom. Get that sucker laid out, come on back, and we start going. Typically, we would have one recorder writing the data down, one observer, and or two observers. If it's taken a long time to lay out the transect tape, one person can be working on the transect tape, another person can be starting to record and or somebody starting to observe another person, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the maximum, uh, the most efficient thing when we're there. But we've laid out the transect tape, and what we're actually counting, what we're actually surveying, is a, is a band, is a two meter swath, a swash. And so here we go, here it, here it is at the start, and what, we, what you're doing is we're walking into the, walking into the forest, and we're counting all of the things that are within that area. Generally, and so, so it's one meter above, one meter below. So it's a total of a two meter wide swath. Generally, it's every two meters. Okay, so we, we walk two meters and stop. If we didn't get any woody trees, and the woody trees are not the trees we see, but only the trees that are within this little area we've defined. If it's, if it's a foot outside, too bad. We don't, we don't measure the DBH on that, on that tree. Uh, generally, we go every two meters, except for the very, very start. Because the very, very start, because we're starting in the trail, the first one goes zero to one meter. It's two meters by one meter. And then one meter to two meters. And then after that, we just go every two meters. Because there's this so-called edge effect by the trail. So we're just walking in, and, and, that's, and that's what we're doing. So all those things we talked about, What's the, what's the uh, depth of the leaf litter? What's the percent of the, um, uh, of the uh, uh, blackberry? How many trees? That's all within each of those little swaths. And we're gonna go, 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 till we get to the end of the transect tape. Done, reel it up, boom, walk, hit the next one. So that's our main survey method. Again, designed with the idea that we probably saw the, mo the most heaviest invasion, at least this was the original hypothesis. We'll see if it's still true but the, 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 this area next to the edge is gonna have a lot of the bad guys. And as we go farther into the forest, we'll have fewer bad guys. Recall also that this is an attempt, this is a management effort. This is not a theoretical exercise. We're not counting trees and going away. So we've designed an experiment, a restoration experiment for Katie, and we're essentially the consultants. We're the free consultants that, that do the work for her. And so our main approach has been to herbicide, to focally spray poisons in the forest. Not blanket, but to actually walk up to individual plants and spray them. It's very labor intensive. But that way we're not blanketing the whole forest and not killing the trees we like. We're, we're focusing on the guys we don't like. If they're a little guy, you can rip a little bad guy, you can rip it up by hand, or you can spray it. If it's a little bit bigger than that, you can spray the the herbicide onto the leaves and kill it. If it's a big thing, if it's, if it's like a big tall adult, we can take a chainsaw and <laughs> cut it down. And then in the, in the trunk, where we've just cut it open, essentially it's, va it's, it's, it's blood supply has been open to us, and we can spray that herbicide right on there and kill it. If it's sort of in between, we'll take a machete and hack, hack, cut a big wedge on, on the side of the tree, get access to its circulatory system and spray the poison right into the circulatory system. And so when we were, when we were designing that, we were, we were wondering if we need to spray all throughout the whole forest 
or start near the trail. And so this, was, this, this survey method is also designed to see um, you know, how far in the invasion is spread into the core of the forest. Does that make sense? So that, that's why this stuff is done this way. So two types, and then there's the other thing that Tom mentioned before, the, the permanent plots. And so we have some other things that are just arrayed around. So some of those are, as Tom mentioned from the, the, the previous talk, we have some squares that are just marked out there that we go and check. So there's those permanent plots and there's these band transects. The vast majority of our data come from the band transects. There's a lot more data from, from those things. Cool? Make sense? Band transects relative to the trail. This is what one of our data sheets, if we use the printed version, will look like. It, don't freak out, we're gonna go over all this, but, but um, the default uh, 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 printed version, it's gonna be variable. So let's have a look at this. We describe the area we're surveying based on the last, the, the last distance in. So the first one is zero to one meter, we call that one meter. One to two meters, we call that two meters. Two to four, we call it the four meter stop. Four to six, we call it the six meter stop. And so what we've done here is, here we go, we have, and we have different trails, we have different sections, they have different letters. So in this one, this is, path, this is woodlands, and this is a path A, it's the distance is 150 meters. Um, now, if the, this is an example, but we would have all, all my team members' names on here, and you guys will get to invent your own team name. So you guys, I already can tell some people are gonna be the 60s disco kings or whatever the heck, right? So, we got that going on. And then if you have a look at it, this is, this is a dynamic data sheet that's meant to be uh, uh, useful in a lot of contexts. Now in this first stop, here we go, stop one, we had a tallow individual that was zero dBH. He was, he was a baby. He was a baby. At, at, at breast height, there was no plant. It was shorter than that, so it, it is a zero it doesn't mean there was no guy there, it means there was a guy that had a zero dBH. So he's a baby. And then the height, surprise, surprise, the height is 0 0.3 meters. Cool? Then here is a red maple that was one centimeter and 2.5, etc. So now in this case, we, there were four trees, it just so happened in this plot, there were four trees, that, woody plants that we encountered. So this one has four. And then we just draw a squiggly line or a line to divide it, and then here we go. Here's the next stop. In this one, there were two mulberry, is that mulberry? I guess that's mulberry. Um, uh, so, so a mulberry that was half a centimeter at, at uh, breast height, and then one that was smaller than that. At plot four, there were no woody trees. So I just wrote none. At plot six, wrote none, right? Always positively noting stuff, not skipping over. Because by, by positively saying there was none or zero, we know that we didn't just space it and forget to write it down, as sometimes happens when we're working all day and we're getting tired. It says, actually, uh, there, I looked, we looked, there was nobody there. So as you can tell, in some cases, if we happen to have a transect with very few woody sheets, woody tree species, we get all of the whole transect on one sheet, maybe. In others, we might need several sheets. So the idea is it's flexible. So anyway, so we'll, we'll talk about getting the data. Um, and then you guys will all have a um, notebook that you can also use to make comments and notes to yourselves. On our first training day, we're going to walk around and you guys are going to grab your own leaves and put them in there. As you're going along, anything you can't figure out what it is, it's, too, it's just weird shaped, don't know, can't tell, take a cell phone picture of it, take a sample of it. The best thing is to take a sample Put it right here in your book, write the survey name, this is 200 meters, uh, you know, all this, that, write this up, and take a picture and have it here. So then you can then come up, well first you can take a picture, you can email it or text it to John or Tom or me. You can say, hey, what, do you guys know what this is? And maybe it's something totally obvious and you guys just haven't seen that much of that. And so we can fire right back, oh, that's a, that's a whatever, that's a red maple. Or if it's something that's either hard to tell or not sure, we'd say, nah, don't know. I'm going to call that unknown plant seven for my group. If I see more of it, I'll just keep calling it unknown plant seven. Then we get together at night or whatever, we can look at it, and I've, I've saved a sample now, so now even if we're far away, Tom, and I, all I've done is taken some clear tape that you guys will all have, and I've just taped it in, right, like sort of pressed it flat. So cool. 
I've taken a photo of it. I have an archive in case my, my book gets destroyed. And I have this unknown thing. And I have, I have this, this. So later on we'll talk. And then it, we, we, John, John will say, oh, it's a blah, blah, blah. Or Tom will say, oh, it's a blah, blah, blah. Then you go back to your notebook, cross out plant seven and write the name in it and go back to your data sheets and change all the plant seven to whatever. Make sense? Anything you guys aren't sure of, anything you're wondering about, take a sample, tape it in your book, no problem. So that's how we'll, we'll be able to crank. And as long as you guys keep track, as long as you're consistent, well, I'm calling this plant seven, it's probably red maple, but I'm not sure. Let me call it plant seven. That's cool, right? So the first day we'll do a lot of this. Second day, a little bit less so, and then every day you'll be less and less and less. Is that cool? So you guys don't have to freak out even if, you, if you're worried about forgetting things. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have cheat sheets, we'll have plant guides you guys will have with you, waterproof plant guides, all this kind of stuff. Um, community ecology is real important, and, and this is, a, for example, a wetland for us. This is a Malibu Lagoon before our recent restoration. This is what this area looked like before Hurricane Katrina hit. So have a look at that. It's, it's you know, big, tall trees go up several stories. It's dark underneath. Look at all those ferns. It's, it's a classic southern bottomland hardwood forest. Classic swamp. This is what it looked like after Katrina on our first trip, or one of our first trips. Look at that overstory. It's all open sky, right? It literally has been crew cut. The, 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 the top parts of the trees, the leafed part of the trees, the articulated branches were just snapped off by the incredible winds. And in this case, you can see all these, there's, in this case, downed trees right there. So this is what we're, we're trying to fix. So we're, Tom already talked about where, we're, where we are. Um, as you'll see, Woodlands, which is our, our historic place we've been working, has a, has a trail. So we're going to park over here, and we're going to walk in, and we have a, a loop trail, right? So we'll, we'll go on this loop trail here. We'll go up here. Here's trail C. We call this C. This is, this is A. And, and we, we'll, we'll get different distances as we go out into the site. Um, you don't, don't write this down or anything, but I'll just run through this real quick. So where these sites are, are, well, Woodlands is just outside of Orleans Parish. The Delacroix site is actually inside uh, the city of New Orleans boundary. So it's kind of cool. So in our case, that means we're working on reforestation in the city of New Orleans and outside the city of New Orleans, even though we're very close to each other. We just straddle the border. So that's advantageous. That's advantageous from a funding standpoint. There's some funding sources we've gone after that are for urban reforestation. There's some funding sources we've gone after that are, that are uh, you know, outs you can't do it in urban areas. So we're very lucky in that we, did, we didn't pick it this way, but it just so happened that we're, we can kind of be in both worlds at the same time. So we're about uh, 10 kilometers from the, from the French Quarter, basically, from the, or from the Central Business District. Um, the area of... Uh, of our core historic area is about 247 hectares. This is it. This is it. There will be no more swamp between us and the ocean in a few decades. One, there's not much, as Tom showed you before, there's not much. What's left is eroding. We talked la uh, last time, we talked about wetland loss and all this and that. It's going away. So all of the sea level rise plus climate change models plus screwed up Mississippi sediment deposition show that we're going to be it. This place that we're reforesting, it's either going to have a lot of forests and be the last buffer for storm surge for the city of New Orleans, or there's going to be nothing between us and New Orleans. So when the next big hurricane comes in, the next big wash of a wave and a storm surge, there won't be anything to break that up. So this literally is the last defenses we're working on, uh, last natural defenses. There's levees and things, but the last natural defenses we're trying to solidify for our friends down here. Um, and like I said before, it was largely ignored for a long time. People thought it was some, somebody's private place and this and that. And so only recently have people come to appreciate the value of this area. As I said before, Katie incorporated her nonprofit first in 2001. And uh, because of what she saw, because the, the, the cutting down of the forest she, she saw, she was worried about that. 
And this is really part of a, of a truly a broad based effort, folks in New Orleans, folks in Plaquemines, to create greenbelt, urban places to recreate. They're also, this, as you know, we get sometimes, we forget what a lot of the rest of the world is like sometimes here in California. City of Thousand Oaks. There's only one other city of the same population that has more green space in the U.S., right? We have a lot of, we have the Santa Monica Mountains, we have a lot of places. If you want to go hike outside, if you want to clear your brain, we can do it on campus. How lucky is that? We can go up the hill and get in Sawiwa. We can go to the beach. Um, that's not necessarily the case in a lot of our urban areas. And so this is a place we're trying to make uh, such that folks from New Orleans can come and ride a bike, take the ferry over, take, ride a bike and actually be able to not spend a bunch of money, not have to pay park fees or whatever. This is a free area, you just park, and, and so that's an important uh, aspect of what we're doing as well. Um, and so, like I said, we started our, these, these transects in 2007, really motivated by those three species that Tom pointed out to you earlier, those three problem invading invader species, all of which were here before Katrina, but all of which were went crazy after Katrina. So, so they were here, they were a problem before, but they just got even to be much more problem, particularly spread into our few remnant patches of uh, natural uh, woodland before. This was originally designed to provide baseline data for subsequent control efforts. Now it's our main tool to see how efficacious was this control efforts. Even if we fail in what we're doing, we're measuring. So if it doesn't, it's, it seems to be working, but, but even if it wasn't working, let's say it turns out this year it stops working, it's important to document. Nobody else is doing what we're doing. This is crazy, right? These are these weirdos from California and Oregon going to Louisiana and helping these folks out. You would think that there, there would be a lot of local folks that are studying the efficacy of the control of this stuff. There, there aren't. There, as with so many of our problems, there aren't a million people lined up to solve it, right? When we showed up, why, why were we doing this? The guys that, you know, I didn't know anything about, well, I knew a little bit, but I mean, I didn't know anything about the, plant, the specific species um, uh, at the time. Why? Because there literally was no one. Katrina had rocked this region like nothing else. Everybody was gone. Everybody had vacated. The people that hadn't vacated the consultant, the consultants that were still around, were sucked onto major projects in the Mississippi River and things like that. There was not, there's not a huge number of people to do the restoration, to survey. So we're it, right? We are the experts. And, and, so, and so we're providing the data, not just for that, but also, is this gonna work? How much does it cost? Yes, okay, yeah, we got rid of all the bad guys, but how much do we have to spend? What's the dollar per acre cost? That's incredibly key, and that's boring ass data, right? That's really slow in coming. That's really not sexy, right? This isn't going on to an Antarctic freighter and saving the people, right? This is day in, day out, slogging through, day after day, year after year, the boring stuff, but the critical stuff absolutely critical stuff. And no one else is getting this data. So not only is this data we're getting going to help us with our, is helping us with our restoration there, also we're able to communicate this to other folks so that people elsewhere can know, oh crap, these guys did it, but it cost X amount of money. If we want to do this seriously, we need to think about raising X amount of dollars, right? So that's, that's very, very important information. Um, Right, okay. Uh, as I said before, we're doing these, th so the trail-based surveys are every 50 meters down the trail. We stop, we go, we go um, perpendicular to the trail, 90 degrees, boom, straight off into the forest, and we count what's there. We record all these things that we talked about. So what's, oh, I left my, I should have taken my words off my slide. So China berry, um, oh, excuse me, Chinese tallow, China berry, Jesus, Chinese tallow, um, when these guys are, so here's that teardrop shape, remember Tom showed you, that little boink, come a little whoop. it's almost like, almost like it was out of clay, and we pinched the tip of the clay, and it came to a point. When these guys are baby, baby leaves, they're can you see how they're, they're red in the middle? They're really sort of rubyish color, red color. 
Now, until we show up, it's always very, this is the right time of the year to come. We could not do this service in the winter. There would be no leaves on the trees. This is a very difficult thing to do in the summer. So Tom and I will go back there and John and I will go back in the summer. It is, it, is, it is tough in the summer. It's very, very hot. It's very humid. It is tough. Lots and lots of mosquitoes. So this is really the sweet spot of the time to do it, is this spring period. So the plants have started to leaf out so we can identify them, but it's not so hot that we can't you know, work really effectively. But what that means is sometimes, depending on the, the coldness and whatever, sometimes everything is leafed out, sometimes things are just leafing out. And so until we get there this year, we won't know, we won't know. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go around and we'll, we'll look at not just the classic adult, pictures of what these guys look like, but also right now, most of our guys, the, the tallow leaves are you know, the size of a quarter or the size of a dime, and we'll figure that out. So here we go, here's, here's tallow, boo, boo, boo. What, is tallow good? No. Ooh, bad. So these guys are an inc incredible plant, incredible plant. So this was the size of this one individual. So um, when, we, when we're doing, we have some areas that are herbicided, we try to kill stuff. We have some areas where there are control. It's really key that when we're out there doing stuff, you guys don't rip up the bad guys. Our normal, our normal response is, let's rip them up. We're looking at the efficacy of our management. So we don't, we kind of want to rip them up, but, but it's also important we don't just go rip everything up because then we'll, in our little teeny band transect, we'll, we'll think we did artificially well. Do you get what I'm saying? So here's one, here's the size of this one. This is about the size of this, of this guy on the left the year before. This is how much it grew uh, in one year. So it grew about three meters. These are incredibly, uh, tallow is an incredibly fast growing tree. And so, th and that's compared to cypress, which is, you know, it's, it, it, it's like our, our, our sequoias and stuff. It's a great big tree, but it takes a long time to get there, right? Tallow is more like a weed. It's gonna take off and go. So we have a tallow. Here's china berry. Here's, here's a just leafing out uh, china berry. You can see all those kind of pointy, almost like pot leaves kind of thing. Um, and then sometimes you'll use the leaves. Sometimes the stems are really uh, helpful. So in this case, china berry has these, uh, when, they're, when they're young, they have these stems that are this dark color with these little white, um, uh, typically horizontal bumps it looks like on them. And so that, that, that's a, a baby one. Uh, here's our privet. You guys have seen this all before. And that's not a pinnately compound leaf, by the way, guys. That's an op those are called opposite relationships, where, where each, le each leaf, there's, for each, there's a pair of leaves, and, one, and they grow opposite each other. Is this a good or bad? Uh, Boo! Boo. We weren't booing Tom's description, we were booing the plant. Uh, so here's one. So here we go. Privet, right? That's the adult. Sometimes they look all skanky because they've been bitten. They were, they were, they were, it was cold and they were just starting to leaf out. So these things can, can, can look, can be difficult to, to identify, especially early on. Not sure. Take a photo. In the photo, make sure that we've written what the plot is. This is, you know, trail whatever, distance whatever, stop whatever and you know, text it to Tom or John or I and ask a question. If we don't know, we'll figure it out later. Okay, there's only a couple organisms I don't want to flag for you. A couple organisms. Just again, we'll talk about more of this when we're there, but just as a quick uh, pinhole in your eye. So, uh, anybody know what this is? Otter, yes. Yes, river otter. We have, we have sea otters, those guys have river otters. Um, and we might sometimes come to a screeching halt in the middle of the road, because I'll be doing our roadkill surveys, because that's what I like to do. And uh, we've unfortunately seen roadkill otters. Uh, yeah, it's super sad. It makes me cry. Yes, but we, so we have otters. This is a blue crab, which is, he's, he's sort of chomping on that blue crab. So blue crab's incredibly important. Incredibly important food source. The humans, but also everybody eats them. The birds eat them, the, the otters eat them, everybody eats them. Okay, so let's just talk real quickly and then we're almost done here. Uh, things to just put in the back of your head, snakes. We do have snakes there. 
Everybody freaks out about snakes. We really only really have one problematic snake here where we live. We're lucky. We have the western diamondback rattlesnake, venomous snake. Uh, so we're moving to the tro not technically the tropics, subtropics, but we're moving more tropical when we go to Louisiana. So we're getting, not only are we getting the, the eastern deciduous forest, these trees are another part uh, of our wonderful country that we're getting a taste of. We're also going to be getting a taste of other critters that have a more southerly distribution. And so um, here is an example of a snake uh, on the middle of our trail. Not venomous. This guy's not a problem. But there are on the order of a couple dozen snakes that are venomous there. The general rule, the general rule is, see a snake? Just let it be. Just let it be. It's probably not going to hurt you. Just let it be. We're doing something. There's a snake in the middle of your path. Just let it be. Right? If you have a PVC thing or a branch, maybe we could scoot it out of the way. But if you can or whatever, leave it. No worries, no problem. If for some reason we can't quite finish that transit, we can stop and come back in an hour or two once the guy's gone. We can come back the next day. Don't worry about it. So, so snakes will just, let's just be careful of snakes. Yeah, something like over 70% of the venomous snake bites in the United States come after somebody handling the snake bite. Right. So we're not going to handle any snake. So this is the first snake I saw in Louisiana that uh, scared me. So this is several years ago. This is a down towards, towards uh, trail, uh, where is this, trail A? This is down on trail A. So I'm walking out and I'm laying out so you can see I have the transect tape. I'm, I'm trying to look for the 50 meter mark to, to put a flagging tape. As I'm walking down the middle of the trail, all of a sudden I heard what sounded like uh, someone had a, a scuba tank and just cracked the tank. It's like, what the hell? Where's that air coming from? And then all of a sudden, <gasps> You know, I went, whoa, I kind of like, whoop, you know, sphincter, whoop. And I was like, oh. And I, so I stopped moving. I stopped moving, and, I'm, and I, like, froze. And I, you know, my, I moved my eyeballs. I'm like, look to the right. No, no, see, look to the left. And I kind of relaxed a little bit. And I, looked, and I turned my head, looked there, looked there. And it's very loud. I mean, like, 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 well, I can't, where the hell is it? And then I looked straight down, and he was right underneath me. So I was almost on top of the guy. And I was laying out a transect tape looking in front of me. So you could say, one, I'm clueless, which is true, but um, uh, very, very uh, hard to see, right? And so this guy was sunning himself, just like our rattlesnakes. This guy's gone off to the side, because I tried to get a picture, but I was you know, messing myself at the time. So, so, um, so uh, I, I, sort of, I sort of stood back and uh, big thing. So this is this this guy was a, a canebrake rattlesnake. It's about this about this this wide in the middle, about five feet long. And so and so that, you know, so I my first time was, you know good. And then when I looked down and saw good good, it was double what. And then it was what do you do right? Like what do you do? And so it was very slowly. Move slowly back, and it, bzzz, you know, it's it pulled back, and it's you know he's sitting there, bzzz, and the, the the rattle is rattling, and like slowly move back, slowly move back, slowly move back, slowly move back, and so I finally got away from it. I'm like, okay, good. And so if you look at this picture, you'll see the transect tape was coming down the middle of the trail. It's off to the side. So then I kind of stood back, and I was like, uh, who, you know, or wah, and he's just like, screw you. Bzzz still looking at me, so I said, oh, I'll take my transect tape, which turns out was the only thing I had with me, and I said, uh, go, and I threw it at him, and he fell on him, he just was like, screw you, Bzzz. And like, what, so it took him about 15 minutes to go off the trail, he would scoot away half a foot, stop, Bzzz. turn back, and then I would go, 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 and he wouldn't do anything, then he'd kind of go a half foot, turn, Bzzz. so, um, we'll be careful. We'll be careful. Snakes, nobody's gotten bit by snakes. We've seen tons of snakes over the years. No one's ever gotten bit by a snake because we're smart about it, all right? We're smart about it. The question everybody asks when we're there is alligators. What about alligators? So this is the very first 
uh, post, this was before the classes, our first survey trip um, with Gentro, someone that uh, Tom and I went to uh, school with. So we're, so we're out, this is, this is in the Chafalaya Basin, and we're looking for places to, we're trying to measure caterpillars because we're biologists. And um, so we're looking for caterpillars, and we pull in this thing, and there's a, it's an oil and gas well, and this guy's, and we pull out in the middle of this cut in the forest, and um, we kind of turn around, this guy's like, what are these guys doing in a rental car out here, right? So this guy's like, hey, hey boy, what are you doing? And we said, oh, we're just sort of like, what are you, are you tourists? And they're like, yeah. And this is, this is soon after uh, Katrina and not a lot of people were back, and he said, what are you doing? So we explained what we're doing, and he said, ah, you want to see a gator? He said, sure, I want to see a gator. So he goes, come over here. So he walks us a couple feet from where the car is, and this is a, a depression, a depression in, in this part of the swamp. And it's dry, but look how close to the surface the water is. It's a couple feet below the quote unquote dry area, right? So the water is always very close to the surface in this very flat, very, very um, pancakey part of our country. And so he goes in and he starts kicking this. So this is a nest. So she's, she, he's drove her out of the nest and we're like, ching, 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 whoa, that's cool. And he's like, ah. We're thinking, uh, maybe we shouldn't be here. Like, oh, no, we'll be all good. Come on, I'll show you. I'll get here. I'm like, uh, yeah. And he's slapping on the water, and she's like, <laughs> he's slapping on the water, and we're kind of slowly backing up, backing up. So eventually, um, she starts to come up, and he goes, okay, that's it. Let's go. And I'm like, what? And then everybody runs back to the car. So, um, so uh, nobody has ever gotten bit by an alligator in our class. <laughs> Dang it, excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent. So our friend Foster Capel, when we go down to have a boil down at Foster's place, he has some, not pet alligators, but alligators he feeds in his pond, so we'll, we'll be able to see some get fed there. But the point is, the point is, um, we've never had problems with alligators except for once. And it was uh, a f not a mean guy, he was a fine guy, but he was Mr. Uh, bad Luck. I'll just say it that way. So we're out doing something, and, and I'm out on one part of the trail, he's on another part of the trail, and I'm saying, oh, it's the red, it's the red, the alligator. I'm like, what? Oh my God, what happened? Alligator, alligator. I'm like, what? And they run back, and oh, man, it was alligator. I'm like, where? Oh, he's in there. Oh man, you okay? Yeah. All right, let's stop. You guys leave this area, let's go to another, go another area. Hour, two hours later, resurrection, resurrection, alligator. What, what, what is it? And and so, the problem was coming in, where we were surveying. And if this was the, this isn't the place, but if this is the place, we're running the transect, and it's getting out, and he was going into the water. And it turns out he was going into the water in a bank that sort of had an under thing and an undercut. And so, that's not good. That's not good. So. Um, I thought it was obvious before. I was pretty sure I'd said it. But just to be clear, we never go in any water. So we're doing a transect. Well, I mean, if, we're in the, if it's in the middle of the thing and it rain and it's six inches of water, that's one thing. But we never go into canals or ponds like this. If you're doing a transect and we're running out and we're at the 24 meter mark, and oh my god, at 25 meters we hit the water, you write, Hit water, stop transect, boom, you're done. Uh, if you don't walk in the water, we will not have a problem. We will not have a problem. So, so uh, alligators, everybody worries about, oh my God, it's, it's you know, you guys want to order some gator sausage, because you won't try. So, right, there you go. So, um, alligators, real quickly, massive, massive conservation success story. One of the best conservation success stories in the United States of America massively over-harvested on the endangered species list when we first started our endangered species list several decades ago. They're awesome now. We, you buy their sausage in restaurants. You can have wallets made out of them. I have little heads, alligator heads you can buy. Those, actually most of those that you, that you find are mostly coming from China, but whatever. But the point is, um, we farm them now. The stuff that you're eating, the stuff that you're making your boots out of, are farmed individuals. 
The wild populations have recovered tremendously well. We still have problems with feminization with, because of endocrine disruptors and plastics and things. And it's not a perfect world, but super numerous. Incredibly strong management, still allowing hunting. So we have people that get hunting licenses and go hunt gators. Cool. It's awesome. Hunters have a good time. The population is healthy. All kinds of good stuff. We've learned some interesting things in the wake of Deepwater Horizon. We screwed up a lot of the alligators. People don't want you to know that. But, but, um, but they're one of the organisms that have, that have shown an, an impact from the oil spill. But the point is, awesome. Alligators are doing great. Uh, they're no longer endangered, no longer a problem. What's that, wait, what's that pointing on the left? Uh, Chinese tallow, there we go. Nice. Boo. Boo. Yeah, right. Support, support by booing. This is by far your biggest problem of the whole trip. Dickberry. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is Blackberry. It, yes, we're going to worry about the snakes. We're going to worry about the alligators. They will not cause you a problem. They will not cause you a problem. Blackberry will be the bane of your existence. That's why I want you guys to have good Carhartt pants, long sleeves even though it's hot out, leather gloves, wear eyeglasses or bring some sunglasses or, or protective goggles. I swear to God, this is by far the biggest problem. We have poison ivy out there, which is we should be careful of that, but really, this is going to be what's going to scratch you the most, what you're going to be swearing the most about, what you're going to be yelling the most about. You're not going to be freaked out of the snake or the alligator or the whatever. It is the thorny, crazy guys. And in this case, you can see this is sort of early spring photos. So this guy has uh, some, some flower. Uh, it, it's just sort of flowering. Um, uh, sometimes, some, some of the year, depending on what's going. If you have a nice patch, they'll actually have berries. You can actually eat them if they're, if they're clean and nobody's been peeing on the leaves or something like that. Um, nice. They're good. That, but, but they are tough. Um, so to deal with that, we will be using machetes. Right. There we go. See? Everybody loves them. Uh, as always, the males say, awesome. The women are like, what is that? Uh, so, uh, we, so I have a video online I'll show you of proper machete technique. Very key. Very key. This is another dangerous thing. Because when we're there and we're showing you how to use them and you're first using them, you're going to be great. And the first 10 feet, you're going to be great. Then you're going to start to get tired. And on hour three, you're going to start to get tired and and that's where you're going to have problems, right? Or, or potentially have problems. So you've passed the cocky, you've passed the, this is brand new, I want to be, be really careful stage, and you're getting a little cocky. I don't know how to do this. I'm, uh, wow, wow, lightsaber, Star Wars, right? All that stuff. <laughs> and then, and then you're going to start to get tired. That's the dangerous time. And the blade will start to get a little bit dull because you've been cutting for a long time. So that's when we really want to step back, take a breath. Okay, I want to do this safely. So safely in a couple senses. You don't, that's also why we wear our hiking boots, you know, good, good solid protection. And so if something does slip, we have something between our skin and this, our toes and this. So when we want to be careful with that, so we're always going to be looking in front of us, making sure. The other thing is sometimes people are, rah, you know, like throw it behind them and rah, rah. No, we don't do that. We only keep it in front of us. And a nice, you'll see in the video, nice steady. So I broke my wrist up at John's place the last uh, two Decembers ago. And so I had to go to physical therapy. So I have an awesome physical therapist for my wrist, Reka. And so I said, hey, can you show me how to properly ergonomically use a machete? So we have an actual hand physical therapist showing us how to properly use a machete. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So, so, so you guys can watch Reka's video and she'll like, ha. Aha! And so, um, so proper thing. So it's it's a solid grip. It's a solid grip. It's not so solid that you get hurt, hurt, but it's always in control. And we'll talk about that. So, in all, all honesty, the most dangerous things are going to be the blackberry and you trying to get through the blackberry. 
The other thing about blackberry is you don't need to cut it. Usually, usually, unless we have a crazy thick infestation, you don't need to cut it that much. You, you know, the first couple times you're like, yeah, but the dude is, right? You're going to do the first couple. <laughs> you're going to do, do the first couple. And I, I get it. I know. It's cool. It's swords and everything. I get it's all good. Lightsabers, it's all good. But, but after you've done that, right? After you've done that and kind of burnt through that glucose, then you kind of think about it. And the goal here is not, and so some people, I'll just say usually males, uh, they want to make a massive archway through the cliff, right? <laughs> and so I've seen some trails where it's like, it's awesome. It's like some, I'm going to my wedding through the arbor, right? I mean, it's like, bzzz, it literally, a couple of people, it literally looked like someone had a hedge clipper, like, and perfect. And like, for like 20 meters, this one, one I was like, what? This must have taken you guys an hour. What the hell are you doing? Like, There's a lot of blackberry. And I was very angry. I'm like, damn it. Damn it. You don't need to do that, right? So, so the, the real secret is how can we get through this as fast as possible? Ideally, a nice, straight, perfect transect line. But if it means going over here a half meter and then going over here and I can just lay it out, as opposed to having to spend 10 minutes hacking through this area, do that. So most of the time, you can use your machete as, as a parter a parter of the blackberry, and you don't need to, I mean, sometimes, of course, you need to cut and get, make through, and get through, but this is not to be a masochistic exercise, right? We're not doing this to have you guys, you know, get destroyed and cut up your arms and this and that, right? It's, it's hey, we're here to document the situation. Occasionally, you might hit, if it's the last couple meters of the transect, and you're looking, it's a solid patch of back blackberry, there's no trees around, and it's just pure blackberry, screw it, stop. And just, you can eyeball the next, you know, the last two or three parts, of the stops of the transect, 100% blackberry cover, zero trees, right? You don't need to do every single last thing. So by far the biggest challenges are going to be blackberry and our machetes. So there we go. That is our quick introduction.